<laughs> well, good evening. Good Thursday evening. Thanks for joining in today. And for those of us that are with us uh, here in the in-house, um, we just are taking a continued look, shall we say, um, in our study for Embracing Trust by Joanna Weaver. In Embracing Trust and the Art of Letting Go and then holding on to that forever faithful God that we serve. So come along with us as we, as we dive into more of, uh, of our study. And uh, I'm going to just open with this as a, as a prayer declaration for our time together here. And so right now, I declare that right here and now, this day and this evening, that each one of us, and I speak this for each and every one of us, um, is filled with your love, Lord, your grace, your mercy, your goodness, and your blessings. For your banner over each and every one of us is love. You prepare a table before me and before each of us in the presence of, in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head, you anoint each one of our heads with oil. My cup runs over, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. And he says, and I will dwell, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that comes from Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6. So, and I'm borrowing some of this. This is not an original, but I am borrowing some of this and adapting it accordingly. So, right now, therefore, I bind all harassing and tormenting voices of the enemy. Any voice that sows fear, anxiety, condemnation, accusations, harassment and torment, I and we reject and we silence that in Jesus' name. I bind all the works of the evil one that is set out against me, against any one of us this day or this evening, and I decree that all frustration, discouragement, bad news, disruptions, disillusionments and disturbances will have no place in this evening, in this night. In Jesus' name, I take authority over all of the enemy's evil plans and declare that you shall not, that's, this is the borderline, you shall not come to steal, kill, and destroy, whether it's my health, the health of my family, finances, ministry, or anything at all that God has called me and he, that he's called you to steward. Jesus has come that we would have life, and life more abundantly, and I declare that, let that one be so. And that's according to John 10.10. 10. And I invite the angelic forces of heaven assigned to me and assigned to you as well, you can fill yourself in there, to fulfill the word of God in each one of our lives. I align this day with God's plans, and this evening and night with God's plans, and his purposes to bring glory to his name. I attune my ear and each one of you that you would attune your ear to the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, to bring heaven, and, to bring heaven on earth in every decision, every choice, and every task that we would accomplish, whether this evening, tonight, and even into tomorrow, in Jesus' name. And right now I invite the seven spirits of God, and the seven dimensions of his glory to open up all over each one of our lives and to come upon me, to come upon you afresh. Let every dimension of his attributes be my portion, be your portion, and increase in my life, increase in your life to benefit others in Jesus' mighty name. And so be it. Amen. Amen. That takes care of anything that's going to try to interrupt or cause any, wreak any havoc. And that covers each and every one of us. Because we have the authority. The authority of Jesus Christ that dwells within us. And if you don't yet have that authority, if you don't yet have Jesus, the one who has all authority. If you don't yet have him as a resident part of who you are, it's never too late. Amen. It's never too late to invite him to come and to take over your life, that you too 
can walk and speak in the in the knowing, in the knowing that you have that authority in the realm of the Spirit. You have that authority because He is our authority. He is Jesus Christ, the one and only true King, the risen Lord, who has covered all, all, all sin. He's, he's already looked after all of that and defeated the enemy, that old devil. He's defeated him by hanging on a cross and his blood flowing, and by his stripes we are all healed. Because he has done the work in Jesus' mighty name. So yeah, we're going to pick up, and you know, I'm going to be doing a little sidestepping as well. So we're going to go from, you know, taking the first bit from the book, and then I'm going to do a little divest, you know, away from this as well. So it's, we're going, for those of us that are here in the room, it's page 168, about the middle, where it says to believe or not to believe. And um, I think I'm in the right place. Yes. And so it says, now aren't we glad, aren't you glad that God didn't tie up the Bible to only include stories of people who always did it right? They always got it right. Good thing he didn't cover all that stuff up. I love it. There's room for me. That's right. There is room for each and every one of us because we all mess up. I don't care who we are. The people of faith who never wavered in their trust or faltered in their obedience. Men and women who were never who were never tripped up by the troubles of life. Isn't it great that God didn't tidy up the Bible to just give those kind of people? But no. David chronicles his story with very clear eyed honesty. And that's the, which is kind of shocking, actually, when we look at the story of David and his life. And many of you have studied that over the years if you've been walking with the Lord. So rather than revis- revising history as, a, as the ancient rulers used to do, purging it of a less than stellar references, David admitted his mistakes honestly. He was humble enough, transparent enough to admit his own mistakes. And he even turned them into songs. So she writes, uh, Joanna here, she writes, "I, I believe that God included these unvarnished reflections in the Bible so that you and I could be encouraged, especially on those less than stellar days when doubt creeps in and our faith begins to weaken. In 1 Samuel 19 to 20, the conflict with King Saul had escalated to a point that David had to flee Jerusalem. Sadly, in his rush to leave the city, David, he appeared, he doesn't say he did, he appeared to leave his faith behind as well, which led to some rather questionable decisions then. So afraid for his life, David fled to the city of Nob where he convinced the head priest to give him a weapon. And that's in uh, 1 Samuel 21 verses 1 to 8. The only thing available was the sword that had once belonged to Goliath. The one that David had used to take off the giant's head. Now with massive weapon in hand, David did something strange. He ran north to the Philistine territory, to Goliath's hometown, and that's in verse 10. And it's also seen in chapter 17, verse 4. What on earth was David thinking? What was he thinking? Who in their right mind goes to the enemy for protection? And why would you take along the sword of the hometown hero that you've destroyed? See, David fled, and it mentions he was afraid, afraid for his life. So was his thinking was maybe not clear. That's what it would indicate here. Well, as she writes, I submit that David wasn't thinking. He was panicked and running scared. Now, how many of us here have had exactly those kinds of experiences where we panic Fear, fear comes upon us, we panic, we run, and as we run in the wrong direction, really, where there isn't any safety and protection. 
So rather than looking to God for protection, he was trusting in his own devices and his own ill-conceived plans. So he figured that he had a way and and he wasn't he wasn't looking to God for his direction at all. We do the very same thing when we allow allow doubt and fear to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God's faithfulness in our lives. See key in there is the the doubt and the fear and it's we allow it. Yeah. It doesn't just sneak in. It can catch us unawares if we're not you know, if we're not paying attention to what's going on in our head and what, what our thoughts are. We do the same thing when we allow doubt and fear to exalt those two things, to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God's faithfulness in our lives. It's almost as if we lose our own minds and forgetting all the many ways that the Lord has already delivered us from things in the past. With these renegade thoughts running wild, we often run straight into the arms of the enemy in search of help. Like, oh my gosh. So maybe, we don't know, but maybe David thought that the Philistines would be elated when he defected to their side. But the opposite thing happened, as you might expect. With his motives called into question, David was forced to feign madness to save his life. So he had to come up with another one of his own plans and schemes to get himself out of the trouble that he just got himself into. The Philistine king wanted nothing to do with a crazy man, and so then he allowed David to leave. Otherwise, he would have been trapped by his own previous enemies. So uh, this frightened man, he ran to the cave of Adullam and hid there. Uh-huh. Just curious, it seems in the Middle East at that time that uh, insane persons were treated unusually well uh, hmm. because I, it seemed like if you were uh, a mystic and totally out of your mind, mm -hmm. uh, which some people apparently were, yeah. in, in the wrong spirit of course, right. um, so they did, would, rather than take a chance on a, uh, angering uh, th these strange gods and spirits, uh -huh. they would allow a, an insane person to, to carry on. Uh, and and then I, whether he was doing that deliberately or, not. or, or he caught on to the whatever, but in any case, it, right. it's, it's why they let him go. <laughs> they, they were didn't want to harm him in case he was mm. in company with some strange spirit. Well, and he, he was. sure behaved that way, didn't he? <laughs> so, yeah, so this, uh, so this very frightened man, he did some of these really dumb things, and which would seem to be like crazy thinking things, and he hid, he hid in that cave. But then as he was able to be there, he, he stilled his heart before God in that quiet place. A no longer panicked David was able to write these beautiful and believing words. In Psalm 57 verses 1 and 2 he wrote, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God Most High. To God who vindicates me. So David, once he was able to get somewhere that he didn't have to feel that he was running, and he could start to get get more of um, a clear a clear thinking and clear mind as he stepped away from what from what his fears were there for what his the threats that he thought were was there then he could start to think, and he turned what was not very good into something much better. He chose, he chose, he made the decision, and he chose the Lord to turn back to the Lord, to return to him for his strength and for his, for his protection. 
So rather than striving and conniving, David started resting and relying. Rather than leaning on his own understanding, he took those thoughts captive and he made them center on God. So even as, whether it's David or any one of us, whether we allow that doubt and fear to come and exalt themselves above the knowledge of Christ, we can also take back and make a decision to take those thoughts that crazy thinking and those thoughts captive and call them back to being centered on God. So taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So applying the word of God. Now David didn't have the word of God as such the way we do today. He didn't know anything about, you know, the scripture that was going to be written down the road. But the Lord in his mercy, in response, the Lord provided everything that David would need for the long journey ahead. So when we turn and trust our king, when we turn and take our thoughts captive to the sounder mind and thinking, then we can come to the Lord, and, and the Lord himself is the one who provides. So the Lord provided everything that David would need for the long journey ahead, including... 400 unlikely men who would become a mighty army. And all of that it was made possible because David chose to exalt God above his fear-driven thoughts. So those fear-driven thoughts, first of all, um, had exalted, he had allowed that to exalt themselves, that above the Lord. But then, as he came to, you know, to stop, and take a few minutes quiet, a little bit of time quiet, away from his running and the fear, then he could make a wiser decision, and he could choose, and he did choose to exalt God above all those things. So now we're going to sidestep it here a bit. And so when we look back at the top of that page, 169, afraid for his life, fear, fear is... is uh, it can be quite a crippling thing. It can be, we each and every one of us have had to deal with some kind of fear. And, you know, the uh, fear versus faith, that type of thing. But there's a kind of fear, a tormenting kind of fear, which is found in First John 4, 18. And, and the other scriptures also um, for that tormenting fear is in Romans 8.15 and 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. Those also, you know, talk about fear and having the mind, um, not having a mind. You know, God didn't give us a, uh, a spirit of fear. But when a spirit of fear comes, we can know that that's not from God. It is evil. So there is the evil side of fear. I'm going to just take some excerpts out of, uh, you know, I'm taking it from uh, Henry Wright's book, and uh, I'm just going to take a few excerpts. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to get some highlights out of this. Um, and faith versus fear. So, a lot of people, you know, fear, faith, what is it, you know, um, we think what we've got faith, and then really there's fear lurking in behind that. And there's so many people that I'm sure you and we've all had contact with that might struggle with, with faith. Like maybe you're sick, and you have a disease, and then you've had people tell you that you just don't have enough faith. Or maybe you've been listening to some of these people teach that you need to do, that you need to do something to get more faith. Well, you know, the Bible says in Romans 12, 3, to every man and to every woman has been given a measure of faith. And it's through the grace that's given, according to Romans 12, 3, through the grace given to me and to every man that is among, among you, but to think soberly according to God, has dealt to every man a measure of faith. 
So you've got enough faith. And it's not to listen to these people who might be well-meaning. But don't let that come against you. Yeah, we can always pray, Lord, you increase my faith, for sure, for sure. Um, but you can still be scared underneath it all. Sometimes that that is an underlying. So we know from Hebrews 11.1, 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Fear, on the other hand, Fear is the substance of things not hoped for, the evidence not yet seen. And do you know how many of God's people, as we were touching on it there, are in that place of fear faith? Not real faith, like, but a fear faith. You may be in fear faith and think it's real faith. But if you were in real faith, you wouldn't have the problem. Unless you didn't understand why you had the problem. So there are so many different kinds of fears. And one thing that fear will do is project into the future. Faith also projects into the future. But they're two different things. Two different features. Fear involves projection, yes. But then from that comes displacement. Which is an avoidance. Fear projects into the future. Fear involves projection and then displacement. What that does then is cause avoidance. So what God's taught through, you know, is partly what we were reading there about David, but what what the Lord has taught from the Old Testament all the way through into the New is that you do not run from an enemy. We don't need to run from an enemy. Because when we look and study the warfare garments in Ephesians 6, verses 11 to 20, there isn't anything for your backside. So you don't run from an enemy in your life, and you don't hide from your mother-in-law. You don't hide from your enemy. You don't hide from fear of disease. You don't hide from your disease. And there, I just wanted to catch that one. It's like, how many people make it own that it's their disease? Oh, my fear. Oh, my cancer. Oh, my this. You know what? Don't take ownership of that. That does not come from God. And it doesn't really belong to you if you... Because it, it's something that the enemy has brought to really attest it. You know, it does be, if the enemy can, he seeks to kill and destroy, right? But it's not your disease. It's not. So think about that, you know, that identifying. And you don't go disappear down inside. Or do you? Or do you? So it's really, it's time for you and me to come up and to take our place in the land of the living once and for all. Hey, what's the worst thing that can happen to you anyway? Yeah, you can die and you can go to heaven. So, what's your problem? <laughs> then what are you afraid of, right? If it was a sickness or a disease. Um, you know, and then there's, in the people, in God's people, the church, we sometimes attack each other too. That would be an autoimmune disease. Why that sign right out in front of some, some churches might, you know, say, you know, the, the, the one that you see when you walk in the front door of, you know, church, you know, you know, church, whatever the name might be, and, and says, Hallelujah, love one another. Oh, you'll know them because of the love that they have for one another. Well, 
Matthew 7.20, it does say, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. And, yes, in John 13, 34, and 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you would love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, and if you have love one for another. In Isaiah 58, 1 to 4, the people of God were saying, Hallelujah, Lord, we love you. You were our father, and you have redeemed us from Egypt. But what happened? They were destroying each other, and then God would not protect them or hear them. So yeah, we come and we worship. We worship you, Lord. We worship you with the songs of David. We come before you, and yes, you are our Lord, our God. And we love to come. We love to pray. We love to fast. We love the law. We love, love, love. But why haven't you healed us? That's the question that so many of God's people were asking in Isaiah 58. (laughs) And yet, do you know what God had to say about that? He said, yeah, I've watched you fasting and praying, but you pray for strife and eat each other alive. I have caused my ears to become deaf to you. This is serious business, right? It's like, so what is Isaiah saying? Like, And that, whether that was Old Testament Isaiah, or whether we come fast forward into our day and our time, not much has changed in the hearts and minds of men and people. What do we do today in our own churches and amongst our own selves? So what's Isaiah saying? God is saying, you want my blessings, but you don't want my friends. You don't want my sons and daughters. Because when we look at that fear, fear is not coming from God that we mentioned earlier. Fear carries with it um, that it get being that evil demonic spirit it's it's not a god it's not a god fear it's not god given and the spirit of fear that evil demonic thing some of some of the the way that that affects us is having like an unnatural fear an unreasonable fear obsessive fear Binding and enslaving fear. And in uh, example for one of the one of the scriptures of you know First John four eighteen, I'm going to read from the Amplified version. Actually, there's a, uh, lots of good ones. Um, the Ampl- I know the King James talks about fear has t- involves punishment, having torment. But there is a f- there is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full-grown, complete and perfect, that is made whole, love turns fear out of the doors and expels every trace of terror. Fear is a terrorist and can be a terrorist for so many people, for any one of us that we've had that, and maybe still walk in some of that. Fear brings with it that thought of punishment, And so he who is afraid has not reached that full maturity yet. That full maturity of love. It's not yet grown into love's complete perfection. And in the legacy standard, therefore there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment or torment, as we mentioned, King James says. And the one who fears is not perfected yet in love. So fear to be tormented is, um, there's so many people that are tormented. Mostly in between here, but then it becomes that thing that 
makes them be a slave to that. They're obsessed and they're, you know with all of that. And you know and <laughs> I'm going to go back to something that uh, that you know when we're talking about fear projecting into the future. about not running from the enemy in our lives. And the author writes, and you don't hide from your mother-in-law. And you know, I'd have to say, uh, from personal experience, that uh, not my mother-in-law, I, you know, God bless her, but there's a certain fear that causes such a bondage and hiding from your mother-in-law the um, because there is such a bondage to fear and that projection into the future events from the, the past perhaps that were perceived or perceived but not from a place of healthy perception but projecting forward that that person always comes back to not letting go there's so then there's a slavery that goes on a bondage and it's, you know, there's so many people with various different family dynamics, you know. I mean, every family has its dynamics, as you well know. So no one is exempt from relationships where there might be conflict or there might be um, those places that somebody in the family is in such bondage to fear. And it's to for us who are, for those that you know, much more mature perhaps, where the Lord's love has set us free from those things in fear, to be able to um, not allow that to control our thinking and who we are in Christ, but to pray, rather, for those ones amongst us. And if we start to recognize that, oh, there's such fear and there's so much torment, that they're caught in that, that place. So it's taking a perspective of that perfect love that would cast out all fear and that we ourselves don't have to walk in that fear. So the author, Henry Wright, he's talking about here, he says, I was talking with somebody the other day that was kind of chewing out about somebody, you know, that gossiping thing. Um, I looked at them and I said, how dare you say that about a friend of Jesus? Do you realize that person is a friend of Jesus? What do you think Jesus thinks about you talking that way about his friend? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about eating and chewing at one another like in the the like in our churches whether it was in back in the days in Isaiah or now amongst God's people that perspective i mean i don't know of anybody that would have that i've ever been in contact with personally that i guess and it was something that huh, huh would I have the wherewithal to speak this out loud myself if I'm hearing and overhearing some gossip? Like, I hadn't thought of it quite this way, but perhaps we need to pay attention. So, you know, that that Henry Ray, he, like he says, how dare you say that about a friend of Jesus? Maybe you, Maybe you don't get along with that guy, but... How dare you say that? Do you realize that that person is a friend of Jesus? 
And what do you think Jesus thinks about you talking that way about his friend? Like, yeah, to actually bring that out to someone if you're right there in a conversation. Like, I don't know if I'd remember, for one thing, but to even have the presence to think like, oh, but I think that's awesome. Somehow, if I could myself even be, you know, um, not afraid to say something, like that fear thing, not afraid to say something to, because we might all be friends sitting around in, you know, in a, in somewhere, but my friend, you know, this friend is talking about that friend, and it's like, you know, you've got to stop and think, this person is also a friend of Jesus. Amen. Anyway, food for thought, and something to consider. So do you think Jesus is our friend? Do you think that, he says, do you think I've got a scripture to stand on? And yeah, we do. It's John fifteen fifteen. Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. So therefore, I call you not servants, but for the servant knows not what his Lord or his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. So then he writes, so friends don't talk about each other. You know what? I venture to say each and every one of us have been have done that somewhere along the line of our walk with the Lord. Um, friends build each other up. Friends cover with love. Why? Because perfect love covers a multitude of sins, and that's what First Peter four eight tells us. In Galatians six one, we're told, "If a brother be overtaken in a fault, those of you who consider yourselves spiritual, restore each one. Restore each one a, a spirit of meekness, and consider yourself also, lest you be tempted in like manner." and fall away in the same type of bondage. And in verse 2, Bear you one another's burdens so that you will fulfill the law of Christ. So we've got some stuff to chew on and how to think about Jesus. He's not just my friend, but he's my friend's friend. Yeah. You know? And in Second Timothy two twenty four to 26 it says... The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient and patient, in meekness, instructing those um, themselves. If, if God would bring them to that place of repentance, to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who were taken captive by him at the devil's will. Not because somebody willingly does this themselves, necessarily, but it's the devil's will. So when a person is in captivity by the devil, they don't know it. They don't understand. So therefore, for those that are in captivity to fear, that are so bound by fear, they're in captivity by the devil. And they just don't know it. They simply don't understand. So it's just an interesting look at fear and the harm that fear can bring and wreak havoc in the life of individuals, but also amongst those of us who are believers. And then there's Romans 8.15. Now. Do you want to grab that, Ralph? Romans 8.15, please. Please. Romans 8.15 
for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, right. but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, yes. Father. Exactly. Yeah, I'm going to read 16. Sure. The Spirit himself bears witness with yes. our spirit mm -hmm. that we are the children of God. Yeah. Amen. So it's that demonic, tormenting fear. So when we read that, then I'm just going to take from some other notes as well that um, that Paul, what he's doing here is con contrasting, <coughs> pardon me, the Spirit of God that assures us that we are his children with another kind of spirit. So there's a contrasting there between the spirits. He calls it a spirit that would make you or I a slave and that spirit of slavery to sin. It's not just something purely natural. This is something in the spiritual realm and its result is slavery. Mm -hmm. So for someone, whether it's someone in the family that um, wants to hide from another person, wants to avoid, doesn't want to, like they project that so-and-so is thinking this about them when in fact that's not at all true. Um, they're thinking, you know, they're projecting that, their thoughts and, and fears into a situation that really is not there. But in their mind, that's what they're still thinking and believing to be true. So that fear right there has kept them all locked up and in bondage. So they are a slave to that spirit of fear. And that's being in slavery to the sin. It, it's just not something that is a natural thing. It's unnatural. And we know, as we've just read, God does not produce slavery in his children. He doesn't want slaves. He wants his friends, sons and daughters. The mark of Holy Spirit is power, love, and self-discipline or self-control. Any spirit that doesn't have those markings is not Holy Spirit. And Paul contrasts this with the spirit of timidity or fear. So many of God's people have needed to be set free and delivered from this spirit of fear. So how would you identify some of these key words. Well, torment. Torment. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has torment. And he that fears is not made in perfect love. We've read about that already. So there's a kind of fear that is tormenting. And it's not from God at all. That's, that's the evil as we've already brought out a few times. That spirit of fear, we've already mentioned it before. The, it's an unnatural, unreasonable, there's no reasoning with it. Obsessive thing, binding, enslaving, capturing and taking captive. There's so many manifestations of that. Sometimes there's just Fear that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense for those of us that are not captured by it. So, so he writes here, he, he says um, two things that, you know, long medical terms that we've all heard of is claustrophobia and agoraphobia. Or I don't know, maybe it's said right, but claustrophobia means that fear to be shut up in a confined space. So, a lot of people have that fear, then they experience that. So, so Henry Wright, he says, my first wife suffered with it for years. 
Then one day, one day we identified it as an evil spirit. She claimed deliverance from the Lord, and after that, she was a different person. So you yourself, as an individual child of God, you can speak and claim deliverance from that thing yourself. Amen. Like, you know, that spirit of fear, you go in Jesus' name. So he writes, before that, I always had a problem getting her into an elevator. <laughs> yeah, and this, this can happen to so many people. She would rather walk up four flights of stairs, and after, but after she was delivered from that spirit of fear, she was perfectly content to go up in that elevator. And that's just one example. Yeah. Other examples that people have is the fear of darkness. Be in the dark. So many people who were unable to sleep without a light. And in a lot of cases, that's the result of occult involvement in many, in many cases. Then there's a, you know, other kinds of demonic fear. It's a fear of specific creatures. Well, I think I could relate to some of those. Uh, like... Rats and mice, for example. I'm not as afraid of them now. But boy, oh boy, there was a time. Um, but specific fears of creatures like cats, birds, and bees. And, and uh, you know, there was... Henry writes that there's one young woman who had just been desperately afraid of bees. Her whole life was controlled by determination never to be anywhere near bees. She was a very highly educated talented young woman and yet this thing came to light eventually she was delivered from it the next day she was eating lunch out in front of an open window a bee flew into the dining room it flew right around her head and flew out again and she didn't budge <laughs> so she had realized that she truly had been delivered so those are different examples of fear, but they are demonic. And we need to distinguish what is God, not God. There is a third kind of fear, but it's it's not a bad fear. And that's... Well, no, 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 pardon me, I misread. The third kind of fear, it's not the fear of the Lord, and is not good, is what he says I would call a religious fear. It was Isaiah speaking about that, and I think just like what you were talking about, whether they might, whether you know they were uh, afraid, like being afraid they might disturb the other gods or their idols or whatever the case was, um, and then you know Isaiah twenty nine thirteen says, and wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. So he calls this a kind of a religious fear. And there is, like, people have fear of the, well, let's just say the Pope, for example. Or fear like, oh, we wouldn't want to tick him off, or, you know, whatever the case may be. But it's really, that religious fear, it's conformity because of rules, because of demands, because of a fear that if you don't do that, then you will not be counted as one of the good people. And the important thing about seeing that it just doesn't bring a person's heart near to God at all. Um, the people Isaiah is talking about had that religious fear, and yet at the same time, their heart was far from the Lord. They could say all the right words, and they could praise, and well, we love you, blah, 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 but, but, their heart wasn't anywhere near God. And so Jesus, he challenged the religious leaders in his day and his time too, from that kind of fear. And he quoted Isaiah to them, in fact. And then in Matthew fifteen seven to 9, he was pretty straightforward. Okay, you hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, or right, pardon me, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, this people honors me with their lips. Well, same thing in Jesus' day, same thing in our day. But their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching their doctrines the precepts of men. So the traditions of men, the religious rules 
of, let's say, a denomination. The religious rules of, if you don't do this, oh, if you're a Christian, you must not dance, oh, these kinds of things. And then that strikes a fear, but it's not fear of the Lord, not a healthy fear of the Lord. It's a demonic fear, and that's not, that's not good. So, you know, there's all those kinds of the fear of man. And then there's the fear of man. That's huge. The fear of man also brings a snare. Because it's he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. Fear of man is not trusting in the Lord. Which brings us to, if we're embracing trust, fear of man or any of these other kind of fears is really not choosing to trust Jesus. We are not embracing the trust of our King. And that's what we're here for, is to to recognize some of these things that keeps us from embracing that trust in Him. The one whom we can always trust. The one who is always faithful. He won't let us down. People will. But he won't. You know? So, it's that kind of a healthy fear balanced with the faith in trusting him. And he writes here, and he says, it's a kind of fear that makes man seem bigger than God. So when you measure man's opinion against God's opinion, man's opinion seems more important. That fear of man. Then what happens, it leads to disobeying God. So, the truth is the fear of the Lord will never lead to disobeying God. That's a distinguishing mark, so that we know the difference. So each and every one of us, we can examine ourselves. Ask yourself. Ask yourself as we think about the fear of the Lord. Do I have the right kind of fear? Do that heart check. Do you have that right kind of fear? Or are the wrong kinds of fear binding me, tying me up, and holding me captive? And keeping me from being the kind of person that God wants me to be. Because ultimately, ultimately, if we don't give way to the fear of man, but we choose to trust the Lord and walk in the fear of the Lord, then he will provide for us just as he did for David. He will provide for us all that we need to accomplish what he has already called us to do, that we can walk out the plan according to his plan in our life, what what our call and purpose is, what destiny, what our destiny is in him. So, just to do a little bit of self-examination, and are there some fears? And if they are, if there's a fear there, I haven't tested it myself, but you know, I've had a fear of heights. I haven't quite tested that one. Um, not that I plan to jump off a cliff anytime soon, because that would be way too far. <laughs> <laughs> and it would cause ha- damage, you know. But, but to choose the fear of the Lord over those maybe unnatural or other fears that would want to try to make that thing bigger than God. And I think that's where, if we, can, if we can look to make the Lord the biggest one, the big person for us, the big God who loves us unconditionally, who does not put those expectations on us, like all the doctrines of men and the doctrine, well, doctrines of demons that are out there. But, you know, um, our God is... He's for us. He's not against us. And if we can just bow our knee and subject ourselves to Him, choosing to take a hold and trust Him, 
then he will lead you and he will lead me in the path that we are to go. And so, for this night, I think we're about to bring it to a close. Um, thank you, Jesus. So even as David wrote in Psalm 57, 1 and 2, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster passes, until it has passed. And I cry out to God Most High, to God who vindicates me. I cry out to you. So we don't have to strive. We don't have to connive. And like David, we start to rest and re rest and rely. We rest on our, on our God, in our Jesus, and we rely on Him. Will you choose to trust Jesus? Embrace Him tonight and every day from here on. Your choice. Lord bless you. We'll see you next week. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, ne I think next week. And, uh, like on the 31st, I believe that's next Thursday. And there's somebody's birthday that day. Uh, Ray will be uh, 74 that day. So I wasn't quite sure whether we might be having a an evening out or not. We may. We'll keep you posted in the uh, Holy Spirit Sands um, Bible study. We'll you know we'll do that if if anything changes. If we're not going to be here, we'll keep you posted on that. And um, going forward, then the following week in November on November the fifth. So that would be about the. Well, on the 7th, uh, there will not be an online study. Um, Ray is to be admitted to hospital at St. Boniface that day on the 5th. Um, and then within a day or so, he is to have either a triple or quadruple bypass and fix up anything else that needs fixing while they're in there. So, so it, you know, it might be, you know, two or three weeks this next time is, you know, is a little bit unknown right now. Um, as far as when we can meet together for sure. But we'll keep you posted and bless you for hanging in there with us. And, and in the meantime, you choose and I choose to embrace trusting Jesus. Good night.